seated. So yesterday, Peggy and I had the privilege of attending the state convention, the State Baptist Convention's annual meeting. Uh, we served uh, wait, as messengers, which means we got a vote on issues. Uh, if anybody would like to see what goes on at such thing, I have a copy of the book of reports. Now understand how we are organized as a Southern Baptist Church. We belong to a local association, the Hudson Baptist Association. Uh, I serve as moderator, actually, of the Hudson Baptist Association. As of yesterday, at the close of the business meeting, I am no longer on the state board, the executive board. I just completed a term there where I was part of the governing process of the Baptist Convention of New York. And we are, in totality, a member of the Southern Baptist Convention. So it goes from a local association, a state association, to a national organization. Okay, This is the state organization's annual reports. It's the finances, it's the operations of the various entities that attach to it. Uh, we have a good time. Among other things, you get to hear a lot of good preaching. And I say that as kind of a plug, because next year, Peggy decided she'd really prefer not to go because this is the time of year when she's busy enough in other things. And actually, she'd have rather been home in the pool yesterday afternoon. Okay? We did get in the pool late, but we got in the pool anyway when we got home. But it's usually in Syracuse. Um, we are entitled to several messengers from the church. Uh, I have not been diligent about putting it out to the public because it's usually at a time when I'm so busy I forget myself. So uh, we had a great meeting. Actually, the meeting is conducted kind of like our own business meetings. We conduct things pretty orderly, pretty efficiently. But we also got a lot of good preaching. We got some messages from various people around the country, from the national convention, as well as from within our state convention. Had a young fellow from Queens who was a lot of fun to listen to, and he stressed the importance of connection. One of the reasons I go to these things, one of the reasons I'm part of like the, the local association is because I connect with other pastors. And then on a bigger basis, we connect with other church members from a variety of places around the state. But well, there's a lot of disinterest. And I'm trying to just kind of drum up a little bit of interest because we are attached to the Southern Baptist Convention. And it's important overall to understand the magnitude of the convention, the amount of work that's done that this little church in Amsterdam is a vital part of, and we really have quite an impact on uh, worldwide, the, the overall operation of the Southern Baptist Convention. So the Book of Reports is here. Uh, I do have two copies of uh, one for the deacons and one for the trustees of the, uh, this is something to do with sexual abuse in churches, and uh, I want to make sure I get one copy of trustees and one copy of deacons. And then there's a copy of, uh, this has to do with the International Mission Board. And what they're asking people to do is look at this map that is in it. And see all the red that you can see? You should be able to see masses of red. Uh, each one of those is an International Mission Board mission or ministry or people group that they're ministering to. And what they're asking is to look at these, and you can go to the website, the International Mission Board website, and you can get a name and a specific set of circumstances. What they're asking for is to adopt a dot. These are not just masses of red, they're dots. That's how thick these people groups are. And the, it's actually, the, the map is the unreached people. That's, that's how it's put together. So go to what, look through this if you'd like. I'm gonna leave these up here. Uh, I'm going to leave that and book of reports up here on the side podium here. And uh, these I'm going to give to the uh, respective boards. Uh, also related to that, uh, a couple of prayer issues. Our leader of, of the State Baptist Convention, Terry Robertson, he will be retiring around the 1st of April. Um, and he is suffering from some pretty serious health issues. Those of us who have met Terry, knew him as a rather robust individual. Um, he's not so robust anymore. He has back issues like nobody's business. Really, really serious, serious back issues. He has surgery tomorrow morning, and uh, I'm going to include him in, in our prayer time uh, because 
He's on no pain medication. He can't be on pain medication from last Monday till tomorrow when they do the surgery. He was a hurt in the owner yesterday, and we tried to celebrate his retirement, and he was not in much of a mood to celebrate. So we're gonna we're gonna pray for Terry this morning, also for the next leader of the State Baptist Convention because we don't have anybody in our sights right now. And uh, we have a good transition team looking to, to do that. And there's going to be other, several other vacancies within the State Baptist Convention, vacancies that are critical. So uh, we're going to make them issues for prayer this morning. Uh, a couple other announcements. This coming Saturday, um, I think it starts at 5 o'clock, the Sack Fall Festival. Right? Um, go, go on up and join the Sack Fall Festival. It's a riot, especially if the weather's great. Anybody ever roll a hamster wheel? <laughs> You're the hamster. Okay. You get in the wheel and you, you walk along the track. Uh, that's that, fun. I'm not sure that's working though. That's the last time you was. Okay, that projected. Uh, there's going to be a dunk tank. No, I'm not going to be in it. <laughs> Did that in the middle of summer. It wasn't a whole lot of fun. That was several summers ago. Got dunked many times. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my own sister did it to me. She missed with all the balls and then walked up and pushed the plunger. <laughs> sister, they're sibling law, what can I tell you? Uh, but there's all kinds of great stuff. Good food for purchase, cider, being freshly pressed at the time. It's a great time. So that's this Saturday afternoon, late afternoon into the evening. It's, it's always a good time and I recommend it. Also for good times, Last Sunday we invited everybody up because the weather was nice and the pool was still warm. Well, the weather's still nice and the pool's still warm. Come on up. Three to five. You want to come for a swim? Uh, you want to just come hang out with other people swim? You can do that. If enough people show up and are interested, I'll even light off another bonfire. Bring your own marshmallows this time. Our bag of marshmallows got consumed. I will not tell you who, but she's small, blonde, with beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> All of a sudden, they were gone. Uh, you can figure out who the most likely suspects are for that. Uh, with that, are there any other prayer requests? If nothing else is up here on the building this morning. Update on Shannon. Thank Brandon. you. Um, Shannon, after the help of a lot of you um, here, um, she's decided to keep the baby. And she's asking for prayers to talk to her husband from time to sleep because she doesn't know the responses. He's the one that wants her to have the abortion. What's the husband's name again? Brandon. Brandon. It's Brandon and Shannon Heath. They're in their stomachs. And Basta. Yes. We travel for the Green family. The Green family, yep. This is a, I get this right, this is a guy trip, right? Right? None of the wives are gone? <laughs> yeah, the wife is gone. Oh, well, your wife is gone? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, so now it's got to stay and keep the voice straight. <laughs> okay, we get it. All right, let me, let me go over there. Anything else? Jeffy Francisco is in our, she's in our parents. We should have a first chemo day at Tuesday. Give me your first name again. Kathy. Kathy. Kathy Francisco. You might remember Nick, uh, he is, he had his second round of chemo this past week. We haven't heard an update, but you heard something this morning. No, but he has now had two weeks off. But he's now had two weeks off. No, so. he's having, he's just starting. He has two weeks, weeks off, yeah. correct. He's had one treatment, two weeks off, second treatment, now he's in two weeks off. So, uh, continue to pray for Nick and Chris. Okay, let's go to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for bringing us together. We thank you for the weather. God continues to be beautiful. And we continue to praise you for your glory as it is displayed in nature. You have given us a wonderful and beautiful place to live. And we cannot thank you enough. Forgive us when we take it for granted. Forgive us when we miss just the glory in nature. <clears throat> which displays your glory, the general revelation, the general blessing and grace you pour out on all mankind. Father, we come before you this morning and we bring before you the issues of the Baptist Convention in New York. I do pray, Lord, that we will have better attendance at the events, better connection with our people, 
as it protects not just the organization, because the organization exists to serve the churches. The churches exist to serve you and your people. And, and Father, if we get into that process, I pray for more people to be involved, from this church, from the other churches, as we at least had a presence there, and many others did not. So Father, we put that before you. We put before you Terry Roberts, and we thank you for his years of service in ministry, 20 years with the Baptist Convention in New York. Uh, we thank you for his diligence as he led. We thank you for his family and his wife, and she supported him throughout this entire time. And now we pray for grace for Terry. Tomorrow morning, he undergoes uh, quite a procedure to relieve some pain, a lower back pain and radiating down to his legs. And uh, he expected he would be virtually crippled this morning from the pain. And Father, I ask you to give him relief from that this morning and let him be at peace throughout the day and let the surgery tomorrow morning or procedure, as it was better called, let that be done quickly, efficiently, and with great effect on him. And help him to then pick up and get his uh, motion back and, and restore his health as well. I ask you, Lord, to be with the many other needs within the state convention, the leadership vacuums that are being created by retirements and people moving on to other positions. Uh, we know several local associations that are going to be leaderless or maybe are in the process now of selecting the leaders. And, and Father, we pray that within those organizations you will uh, put men to lead and lead effectively in a godly way. Father, I thank you that Shannon has decided not to have an abortion. One of the many pieces of our dysfunctional culture is this matter of abortion on demand. Uh, Father, we understand the position that she is in, and we praise you that by the information that was relayed to her by way of Melissa, and, and all the good advice that was given her through the folks in this church. We thank you that she has made the decision not to keep the appointment that had been made. Give her courage this week as she sees her husband and meets with him specifically. And it's not going to be an easy process. Young couple, financial strain certainly, work busyness certainly, all those things that come in on a young couple's life. And I pray for a transformation in his life, strengthening of her faith, and a strengthening of the marriage. Father, I, uh, I, I ask you to give Kathy Francisco as her, her chemo starts. Uh, we, we pray that she is uh, ministered to effectively by her, her medical professionals. I pray that everyone involved in her care gets it right and that the treatment works. We continue to pray for Nick and for Krista as Nick undergoes chemo. We pray that as he works through this process, which is not going to be easy, nor is it going to be quick, we pray that the, continual, uh, that the chemo will continue in its effectiveness um, in the treatment, as it has been already, and we praise you for the impact that the, the treatment has already had on his tumor. We ask you to be with Green family. We ask you to be with them as they travel tomorrow evening down to New York and an early flight tomorrow. Uh, we thank you for the family love that they have that keeps them gathering in this time. And it's, it's not an easy time. It's a funeral of one of Stanley's brothers. But Father, as the family gathers, let it be a time of strengthening the family bonds. And uh, Stanley and his family are there. We pray that you will give them opportunities to minister your gospel among those who have the need. And we pray for that entire process. And now, Father, as we turn into the next phase of our worship, assigning value to you, I pray, Father, that you will be blessed as we give to you a piece of what you have given us. You have blessed us greatly. And we pray that we will use those blessings well we distribute them from this church. And we ask this in Jesus' name.
morning again, guys. As Lee introduced these songs to you, I will let him do his thing in telling us all about these songs that he has prepared. So, a few weeks ago, I was actually looking ahead in the rocks. I hadn't really fired out any songs after Hamlet's piano piece. I said, like, oh, I better do that. And uh, so I prayed about it. I was like, what should we do? Because I was looking at it, and we're in Paul's journeys, and he's going out. And I was like, what well, music goes with that? And it got, it was spoken into me that Paul was fearless. He went into the lion's den over and over and was rejected many, many times. But if all the accounts are true, by the time the end of his ministry came, he probably looked like a pretty battered prize fighter for all the rocks thrown, shipwrecks suffered, all the things he endured. But he never faltered. And that's a thing that sadly we lack in, in our Christian culture today. We need to be more fearless. We need to be not so afraid of presenting the gospel to our co-workers, our friends, our relatives. And we have to be more fearless about praising God, about lifting our voices. So the next few weeks, we're going to be doing songs to focus on that. With some help from uh, certain, well, <laughs> some, not my calls. we're not soloists, but we're going to, I'm going to be amped up a little more today, obviously, and uh, next week uh, we'll have some other people doing it. And the choir is going to be uh, singing as well. But all of this is all about just let go of those inhibitions. You feel like raising your hands, raise your hands. You want to sing out, sing out. Don't worry about the, the voice quality. It's all about praise and worship. Be free. So this first one, Christ Be Magnified, actually came when we first heard it. Bill and I were, were sitting up at SAC the first week. And they did this to me, so he looked me and ordered me, he says, you gotta do that one. <laughs> well, it's been, a, it's been a while since then, but this seemed to be a good time to bring it out. So Christ be magnified. <laughs> Oh, 
favorite song. It's been very popular online for Grand Lake. Most Grand Lake stuff is pretty rocky stuff, but this is the one piece that really is so well done and so gets it into your soul, into your feelings. And it's called gratitude. And it's like, what do we have to add to the cross? And the answer is good. We don't have anything to add. Everything's been done. There's nothing we have to do to earn the glory. But we can give praise. And we always have to focus on giving that praise. This one's called gratitude.
can feel the spirit within us. And so many times we have it down. We say, no, not now. We may not take it away. Let us break that habit. Give us the will to sing out, to praise you over and over again loudly, to give out the testimony of your word to all who listen, and to bring a friend, a family member, a co-worker, someone who responds to church with us. If we all, every family brought just one person to you, Lord, and brought them to church, this church would be full. And it's not been full for too long. So give us that spirit, Lord, and lead us in all our ways. And that's this your son's way name. Amen. I'm thankful for Lee, for Diane, and for Hannah as they choose music that fits what we're preaching. Uh, I find it very interesting. This, this church, we may not be perfect, we may not be loud, we may not be get it all right, but. We sing to God's glory, we sing to God's honor, and we sing songs that have meaning to them. I say that because yesterday, as much as Peggy and I enjoyed the conference yesterday, the music left something to be desired. You know, we talk about seven eleven songs, seven words sung eleven times. <laughs> we were up to it, we figured it was like eleven fifteen songs. They they were highly repetitive. There wasn't a lot of meat in some of it. Some of them were flying in lyrics, but just so repetitive they kind of got all of you get on with it. These are these are meaningful songs, and I thank you for introducing new ones to us today. Thank you. Much. If you're looking in your Bible this morning, we are still in Acts chapter 13. We were going to go this morning to verse 13. We're going to read through verse 35. It's a little bit of a long passage, but. It's about the first logical breaking point in the narrative. Beginning at 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphyla. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Poseidon. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of his people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm he led them out of it. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. And all this took about 450 years. After that he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king of whom he testified and said, I have found in David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me, one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we look into this passage this morning, let us learn from the history lesson that is given there. Let us learn from all that went on in this time period. Put it to use in our lives as we take your word to a lost, and dying world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. A little geography. I'm not trying to, to step on Sean's toes. Sean is self-identified now as our geography theologian or geographical theologian. I forget. Geographer theologian. Okay, geographer theologian. Okay. I'm not trying to step into his realm because he's got it far in more detail than I am. 
But if you look at the slide there, we see on the southwestern corner, we see where Paul, Barnabas, and Mark were. And then we see the path they traveled to go up to the mainland of, of uh, really mainland Turkey. Uh, and then you see a trace line back. That's where Mark bailed and went. And then they went overland from there and they went on up to the city of Antioch. Next week, that green line traces over to Iconium. You may see that same map next week. I may or may not put it in the slides. Uh, but for this morning, we're going to talk about the time they spent in Antioch. There's a great statement of Winston Churchill. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Generally speaking, when I cite that, I cite the originator of it, but the more recent history is Winston Churchill. The originator was a guy named George Santayana, a philosophical uh, writer of some years before Churchill. Uh, throughout the Bible, we have a whole lot of recountings of the history of the Jewish people, often in abstract form, just pulling out the high points, portions of their history. Uh, we see it in more detail. If you really want the detail, I strongly suggest if you have never read biblical history, I strongly suggest you go back and read Genesis and Exodus. For the moment, you can leave Leviticus behind. Uh, it's kind of tough, isn't it, Hannah? Hannah taught the ladies' class not too long ago and taught through the book of Leviticus. I'm still amazed that she made it through it in any amount of time at all. I would have expected her to last till she was about 74. <laughs> That's how rich that book is. But she did a great job of it from all the ladies, from what I understand. Um, you can leave Leviticus in the, in the background for a while. So you got Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, which recounts continuation of the travel across to get through to the Promised Land. And Deuteronomy is then a second telling of the law. It's kind of like uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the law, the process by which they were supposed to live within the Promised Land. Then you have Joshua Judges. This is the conquest of the Promised Land. You have the time of the judges, which was chaotic in the nation of Israel. And then you can go to Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, take you all the way up to the Babylonian exile, the return from exile. We can find that a little bit later. We find that in Ezra and Nehemiah, commercial for Wednesday nights. John's going to be doing a series on Ezra. And just because he's probably going to wind up going right into the MI, I think. If he doesn't, I'll probably find a way to put it in some way. So, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, and you also need to read the book of Habakkuk. I'm sorry, Haggai. One of those age names. Uh, Haggai also has some recounting of the details of the rebuilding of the temple. So there's your history that you can get, just those are the books you need to get the historical narrative down. Uh, so as we get into our text this morning, we have another, yeah, kind of a boring travel account. There's not too much to it, except there's the significance that Mark bailed on them and went back to Jerusalem. We find Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. They are in the synagogue on the Sabbath. They are Jews. They worship still on the seventh day. They met at the synagogue, that was what they did, and when they had the opportunity, we don't know, scholars kind of differ on why they had the opportunity. Maybe Paul was recognized as a teacher by some reason, maybe somebody said, you got to hear what this guy has to say. We don't really know, but they were given the opportunity to speak. Paul never turned down an opportunity to speak. He never lost an opportunity to share the gospel. We learn a lot just in that. He lays out his argument for Christ, and with that I have to insert yet another commercial. On the back table, we have been given a lot of books, and some wind up on the rack out there, and Sean has been rotating them from the free rack at the Mission Thrift Store to here, and then from things that haven't moved, takes them to the thrift store and tries to get rid of them there and get them out to the people who might want them. But bringing fresh stuff in. On the back table, we have a couple of different resources. I, we have, at least this morning, we have three copies of The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. 
learn how to make a case for Christ. Lee Strobel does it very well. There's also a book called Cold Case Christianity, written by a retired police detective. I've read it, it's great. My mind works the way this does, so that, that part of it works very well. Cold Case, Cold Case Christianity has uh, a workbook with it, and the second book by Wallace, uh, Forensic Christianity or Forensic Faith. Please take them. There's also a video and several study guides for uh, Strobel works. So, commercial ended there. So, Paul begins to address the people of God. He started out by saying, you who fear God. You know, men of Israel, that's his own kin, so to speak, descendants of Abraham. And then he includes the seekers who were there. The proselytes, those who were people who were curious. Proselytes had converted to Judaism, even though they were Gentile by birth. Then there were the seekers and the God-fearers who came in to find out what is this God all about. This is a real God. He stressed his connection by saying, the God of this people Israel. There's nothing new here. This is what he's saying. There's nothing new here. You know the history. And then, of course, he goes on. But he doesn't just give them the history. He gives them not the Paul Harvey version of the rest of the story. He gives the Paul the Apostle version of the rest of the story. Because he starts back with a history lesson beginning in Egypt. He doesn't go back to Abraham. Egypt, the people in captivity. They had a rather pathetic start. They had the offspring of Abraham, Jacob and his sons. 75 people in all going to Egypt, kind of as refugees, for food. There was a famine in the whole world, in that region of the world. They go there for food. While they're there for roughly 400 years, a little more, while there, they grew into a people of somewhere between 3 million and 4.5 million people. That's population explosion. Okay. But that's the dynamics of population growth from even a small group. Okay. And then they were enslaved by the, the reigning power in a later time of their time there. They wound up in captivity. They were oppressed from all directions. God sent Moses as a savior to bring them out of captivity. And by the mighty hand of God, and we can go back into Exodus and we can see how all this happened, they were brought out of Israel. First thing to note is they were chosen by God. God didn't have to pick them. He chose them for a specific reason. And it's not an accident. This is not a matter of a people group inventing their own God. We kind of do that in our own ways, even in this day. They didn't invent their own God, as some cultures appear to do and they have done. This was the sovereign act of the one true and living God. He saved them from both the famine of the day, and if you really examine the totality of the Old Testament, he saved them from the culture in which they were living. When the famine came upon them, they were removed from Canaan, which turned into a totally decadent culture. Totally decadent culture. And under Moses' leadership, they headed east, they got through the Red Sea, and almost immediately, they started trying the patience of God would follow them through across their wanderings. And without working over all of the details, you have to read Exodus and Numbers for all that, and then Joshua and Judges, really. It started out of the Red Sea and their lack of faith. They go, oh, the Egyptian army is going to come and take us out. They're going to wipe us off the face of the earth. God opened the Red Sea, took them through it, brought them out on the other side. And what do they do? They worship a golden calf. They make the golden calf. They created their own deity. Mm -hmm. Idolatry in its finest. Okay? They went through times of grumbling, groaning, more idolatry, gross immorality, outright rebellion against God's chosen leaders, and then their crowning achievement when God said, here's the land to which I am bringing you. Go on into it. Conquer it. They said, oh no, oh no, we can't do that. People are too big, the armies are too strong. Oh, no, can't do that. They rebelled totally against God. And for that, God allowed them to spend 
an entire 40 year period of time, enough time for that generation to die off, a new generation to come up behind them. Then God fulfilled his promise and took them into the promised land. He drove out the nations before them. Mighty acts, just one dimension with Jericho. What kind of battle strategy is marching around the city for seven days, once a day, and then the seventh day they go in, they blow their trumpets, smash their pictures with their torches, and they go in and they conquer the city. That, that's a terrible battle plan, but it worked because it was God's battle plan. He facilitated the entire conflict, driving the nations out before them in many cases. And then as they established their own population and their own culture within the region, he essentially gave them cities that had been abandoned. They gave them crops standing in the field. What blessings? What God? Right? Then they established the kingdom with Saul and then David and then Solomon. And if it hadn't gone downhill under Solomon, it really went south after that pretty badly. Kingdom split. And all this history was well recorded. After the split in the kingdom, the north kingdom went into exile, then the southern kingdom went into exile. And they didn't learn. They failed to learn the lessons of history. The lesson of history was prosperity brought apostasy and sin. That brought judgment and oppression, and that led to confession, which led to restoration. Wouldn't it have been easier if they just caught themselves in the sin and said, oh Lord, are we sorry? We made the mistake, repent, go on about a godly direction again. Wouldn't that have been a whole lot more sense? Uh, apparently, it didn't go that They continued to go their own way, finding their own paths into sinful behavior. And God endured it. Some other translations say put up with it, suffered it. All because he had a purpose. And we'll catch a side note here. Back in verse 17, Paul references God's selection of David as a man after his own heart. David was the man to lead God's people. So God's plan, what was that all about? Well, we see it begin back in Genesis 3, verse 15. We call it the Proto-Evangelium, or sometimes we pronounce it Proto-Evangelion, um, which is more Greek proper pronunciation, but it's pretty much the same thing. Long before the text of this morning was written, we have Adam and Eve sinning, we have God giving Satan the bad news. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, some translations say crush, and you shall bruise his heel. So that was the beginning of the gospel. That was the first gospel. After the flood, after Babel, the dispersal of the nations, I reference that in Sunday school this morning, we have the captivity, then Moses, the burning bush, and what God says to Moses is, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, deliver you from slavery, and I will redeem you we see three things there. We see three definite statements of the promise of God, which is revealed within the purpose of God. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. And I will redeem you. The redemption comes in Jesus. But that's another early glimpse of the gospel. Okay. We see another piece of it in Isaiah 11.1. Paul alludes to this, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, David is the son of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. That fruit is Jesus. <clears throat> then Paul zeroes in on the fulfillment of that promise. Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, born in Bethlehem, crucified, risen, coming again. But he quotes John the Baptist. Generally, John the Baptist was well respected throughout Judaism of the day. He was respected as a prophet, the last of the prophets that we would presume. Okay, And John the Baptist identified Jesus as the one whose sandals he was worthy to untie. This is where things 
start to change in the response of the people when they have to come. Okay, we're going to stop there this morning. But we're going to ask the question, what's in this for me? Well, first of all, we chase this down. Who are the people of God today? So what does it mean today? Are we the people of God? Well, yes. The simple answer comes from 1 Peter 2.9. This is Peter speaking to a scattered church. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to take the light he gives us and then proclaim that light to the rest of the world. And Peter's not talking about an ethnicity here when he says a chosen race. We as believers are one people, the people of the church. Going on into eternity, we're going to see, trust me, he doesn't just paint us all the same color in eternity. And he says there will be a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. That's what it's going to look like when we go into the eternal kingdom. People, a great multitude that no one can remember. Just imagine what that's going to look like, that mass of humankind. What a great thought that is. If we're believers, if we're followers of Christ, we are part of that people group. If not, all of the New Testament, particularly the Old Testament, shows it not quite as clearly. But in light of the New Testament, we have to understand that we are either a people of God or we are not a people of God. The people of God are destined for eternity and glory with Jesus. Those not people of God, their destination is the lake of fire. All believers of all time, past, current, future, will be with Jesus in eternity. But the lake of fire awaits all those who do not trust in Christ. And that's the bad news as opposed to the good news. Satan loses. He'd been given that message way back in Genesis, and we see it playing out in the book of Revelation. He ends up in the lake of fire, which is really designed for him and his angels, and the rest of the death and hell will go there as well. And we will continually reinforce the fact that we must trust Christ. Nothing else. We don't trust anything we do. We don't trust anything other than the full word of God, the revelation of scripture, in what it tells us how to trust Christ, what he is, what he was, what he will be, what he did for us, paying the price of our sin on the cross. So the people of God, People of God are those who believe the promise of God. We ultimately will see Christ get his reward. There's an interesting comment uh, that I came across over the last week or so from a guy named Gresham Machen. Um, he said this. He said, those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ are in a far more blessed condition than Adam was before he fell. Adam, before he fell, was righteous in the sight of God, but he was still under the possibility of becoming unrighteous. Those who have been saved by the Lord Jesus Christ are not only righteous in the sight of God, but they're beyond the possibility of becoming unrighteous. Think of that. If we are saved, we cannot lose our salvation. People need to hear that. Because we all sin. We all have bad days. We all will have doubts. Had this conversation with somebody, I think just last week. Uh, I've had this conversation with so many people. Uh, I can't remember all of them. But one conversation last week. What happens when we sin? The sin is still forgiven. Because if we had trusted Christ, we are forgiven. The danger is some people think they have trusted Christ. They may have said a prayer, they may have walked front, they may have had somebody pray with them. They may have done any one number of things. But the matter is the faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the true faith is the transformational faith. It is a faith that requires repentance. Continuing with uh, 
the uh, statement that was made talking about the righteous who can't become unrighteous. In their case, the probation is over. It is not over because they have stood it successfully. We're going to fail. We're going to fall down. It's not over because they have themselves earned the reward of blessed assurance, which God promised on the condition of perfect obedience. No. God just, he'd love to see us in perfect obedience. But, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. The danger is over because Christ has stood it for them. It's over because Christ has merited it for the reward by His perfect obedience. We are cloaked in the obedience and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are not cloaked in our own righteousness. Mm. Thank God for that. And the next question, do we try the patience of God? Don't even try to tell me no. Do we learn from history? No. Not as often as we should, anyway. We don't learn from history any better than the Jews of that day, the audience Paul had that day, or anywhere else in the rest of the book of, Eve, the book of Acts, across the province of Asia, within Jerusalem. No. We don't do much better. We all fall back into sin like that proverbial dog in his vomit. Um, it may not be the big sins. Let's hope it's not the big sins. But we return to the little sins. The gossip, the anger, the jealousy, the backbiting, the doubt, the fear, the failure to obey. And that's failure to obey in the little things, not just the big things. See, our need is the same as when David committed adultery and murder. If David, the, the man after God's own heart, it's the same need today. Confess, repent, be restored, and move on. And then are we living according to the promise of God? Have we really been brought out from under the burden? Have we really been delivered, or are we still living like we're still in Egypt? The oppression, the slavery of sin. Many people have sinned that dogs their lives. Many people do. If we are saved by Christ, we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to live above that sin. We have been delivered from the penalty of sin. We are being delivered from the power of sin in our lives. Ultimately, we will be delivered from the presence of sin in our lives when we're being saved. Either at rapture or at death. Whatever that is. If you've never trusted Christ, today is the right day to do it. We're not assured tomorrow to make the decision. Now is the proper time, the accepted time to turn to the Lord, not tomorrow. If we are saved, are we living like it? And if we're living like it, are we sharing it? Do we take the opportunity as Paul, every time he was given the opportunity to speak, he did. And he spoke the gospel. He spoke the truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Freedom from the bonds of sin. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of it. I thank you for your servants, Paul, Barnabas, all the others we're going to meet in this passage uh, to come. Father, they did great things. They did it for you. But they did it in your power. Let us be empowered by that same spirit. Let us be bold in our witness for you. Let us never turn down the opportunity to speak the truth, to speak the good news of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
if he is speaking to you, then you need to respond. We know that those of us who can testify to the fact that before we met Jesus, we were somewhat in the dirt and in the dungeon then. But meeting Jesus, accepting him in your life, there was a change to him proclaiming Lord. This song in one five six it says, Jesus, what a friend for Indeed, he is a friend to sinners.
Father, dismiss us with your blessing. We thank you for having blessed us as you have. We thank you for the history lesson which we saw this morning in your scripture. We pray that we not repeat our own mistakes of our history, but come to you for confession, repentance, forgiveness, and then to continue with our lives. We ask your blessing as we dismiss, keep us safe, return us together again if you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.